Hello, assalamu alaikum, good evening, and welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. Well, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, we have a very special guest here today. We are delighted to have with us uh, Mr. Amritjit Singh, who is the Langston Hughes Professor of English at The Ohio University, also served as Senior Editor of Mela, Multi-Ethnic Literature of Americas, taught 20 years at the Rhode Island College and an internationally known critic and scholar. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Yeah, pleasure to be here. And likewise, likewise. Here. Now, uh, you know, you have had a, a, a remarkable career uh, and still enjoying one as well. And um, I'm sure there are many other you know, avenues that you are going to cross and come across. Um, let's talk about Pakistan. What mm -hmm. brings you here? Well, uh, the, I have wanted to come back to Rawalpindi for in Lahore for a long time. I was born in Pindi, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have direct memories because uh, the family moved in 1947 mm -hmm. to uh, Ambala cantonment right. uh, when I was two years old. Mm -hmm. So most of what I know about uh, Pindi is through uh, the stories I heard from my parents and my grandmother and from my older siblings. I was number five in a family of six siblings. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and it's a, really a dream come true that I've been able to visit. The main reason why I'm here is a major humanities conference mm -hmm. at Farman Christian College. Okay. But I'm very fortunate. I was able to um, pack a quick visit to Peshawar. Mm. I went to the Joga Singh Gurdwara there and also visited the campus. Amazing. University great. of Peshawar, and then now I have a, an opportunity to spend, spend some time in uh, Pindi and Islamabad. So I'm delighted to be here. That's great. That's wonderful to know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk about you know. Th then you left. Um, you left uh, Rawalpindi, went to Ambala with your parents, of course. Time partition. Uh, your time growing up there. When did you you know realize that you had the this affinity towards literature and the written word? Oh, that, that uh, came early. I, uh, my father was a professor of literature. Mm -hmm. In fact, he taught at the Garden College. Right. He taught uh, Punjabi. He also had a few schools, you were saying. I remember yeah, you were talking and he about. also had uh, some private schools. They were known as popular high school. Uh -huh. There was a popular high school for boys, and mm -hmm. there was a popular high school for girls, and there was a popular high school for boys and girls. Okay. So he was uh, quite an entrepreneur. Right. And uh, while he was teaching literature at Garden College, he was a masterful uh, teacher of math uh -huh. and physiology at the high school level. Right. And very popular. You seldom see both. Sort that's of, right. You know, it's amazing. the literature and, I, and the maths. That's see. right. Even yeah. uh, my uh, sisters and brothers and I learned math from him. Mm -hmm. uh, when we got to middle school and high school, he paid special attention to us. So. And, you know, we had very close relationships. We lived in the Arya Mohalla. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope to visit there later today. I don't remember the house yeah. we lived in, mm -hmm. although my brother came here 20 years ago and he was able to visit the family that okay. lived there. And they were very welcoming mm -hmm. and very hospitable. And uh, uh, we had a very close tie to a well-known figure in Rawalpindi. And I've not been able to uh, identify uh, any, uh, you know, descendants so far. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, Hakim Amir Ali. Uh -huh. He was a well-known Hakim. Mm -hmm. And he is the one who told my father in January or February or maybe early March, he said, son, I want you to move the family to the other side mm -hmm. because he knew mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of violence was coming. Mm -hmm. So in our uh, family, uh, mm -hmm. there were no loss of lives, uh -huh. which is a rare thing. Right, true. For those of because us who every went family through, has every family had losses like that. Their stories, exactly, on yeah, both sides yeah. of the divide. Unfortunately, and my two mamas, my two mm. uncles, uh, were rich farmers mm -hmm. in Ferozpur, Mukhtar, mm -hmm. and they fed us for one year mm. before my father got a job at GMN College Ambala, right. which was a reincarnation of DAV College Rawalpindi. Mm. So yeah, Pindi is uh, all over, and. Uh, then the principal of uh, Garden College uh, visited us mm -hmm. several times. I believe his name was Mr. Cummings, mm -hmm. tall fire fellow. I remember him as a child of uh, 
you know, five or six or seven years old. Right. And bringing us gifts and uh, excellent. So, so the bond has always been there. The bond has always been. It's there, always but been you underlying. Are, yeah. So they, uh, you asked about literature. So I was reading uh, Punjabi and then Hindi. I was one of those unfortunate ones after the partition who did not get to learn Urdu in Persian script. Mm -hmm. But uh, I read a lot mm -hmm. in Urdu literature. And then uh, I became a math major, mm. and it, uh, which okay. I did not like. Uh, so right. coming back to English was no problem. Oh, okay, so th there was the maths as well in that too, right? Yes, okay. as an undergraduate. <laughs> okay, yeah. fantastic. Right, so then things changed. Yes. You went to America uh, in 1968 for yes. your PhD. Yes. And originally, you were going to work on your dissertation on Ernest Hemingway. That's right. But that all changed. Yes. And in fact, you wrote your dissertation on the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. Now, that seems to be such a completely different domain. So how did you find yourself Yeah, there? It's, a, it's an interesting story, I'll tell you quickly. Mm. Uh, I read uh, Richard Wright's Native Son, mm. 1940, the first best-selling novel by an African-American writer. Mm. And uh, I was just so completely uh, swept off my feet and haunted by the events uh, uh, narrated in that novel mm. that I wanted to work only on Richard Wright. Just as before I came to the United States on a Fulbright, okay. I wanted to work only on Hemingway. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then uh, a, a friend of mine who had done his PhD with uh, my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor mm. Gibson, he persuaded me that the three, three new books on uh, Richard Wright had just come out. Mm. And he said, Amrit, you would be very wise in focusing on the novels of the Harlem Renaissance. Mm. And that book is still in print. It's called The Novels of the Harlem mm. Renaissance, 1976, right. Penn State Press. So before you, was anyone, did anyone, had anyone done any serious work on the Harlem Renaissance? A book came out uh, uh, by a uh, African-American historian, Nathan Huggins, mm. Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 1971. I finished my dissertation in 1973. Mm -hmm. So I was probably one of the first few right. who explored it and my focus was uh, entirely on tw 21 novels okay. by uh, 12 novelists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, 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 I, I tried to uh, divide my analysis mm. into areas of color consciousness, class, mm. Uh, global awareness mm. uh, and so on mm. and uh, it remains a kind of uh, uh, useful introduction right. for undergraduate students to this day. So when we speak about the Harlem Renaissance it was yeah. you know that time after World War One and um, sort of 1930s where we had black pride coming forward in the form of poetry in the form of visual arts in the form of writings. Yes. Um, Tell us about you know uh, the 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 giant names there. We have um, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay as well. Their writings and also, you know, was this just did it have an impact practically on the situation of African Americans living there, or was this just a voice car being carried forward? Where do you place that, this? Those those are very good questions. Uh, first of all, yes, you mentioned two big names, but there were many others, mm. uh, including uh, Wallace Thurman, uh, on whom I have done a considerable amount of work. He was a very brilliant writer, mm. and Langston Hughes and others uh, really admired him. He did uh, die young at age 32, and he published three novels, and he we collected his uh, uh, unpublished and uncollected writings in an anthology called Collected Writings of Wallace Thurman. Mm. Then there is, of course, uh, someone who has gained a lot of attention in recent years, Zora Neale Hurston. Mm. Other women writers include Nella Larson, mm. Jesse Fawcett, Marita Bonner, mm. and uh, uh, among the male writers, uh, Wallace uh, uh, Rudolf Fisher. Mm -hmm. who was an absolutely brilliant short story writer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then Dorothy West, who lived uh, all the way into her 90s, 
just as Wallace Thurman died young, mm. she lived uh, the longest uh, mm -hmm. of the lives of the Harlem Renaissance figures. And, uh, you know, uh, generally, uh, as I did in my book, and I look back and uh, I probably uh, was not entirely right, mm. I tried to uh, uh, suggest that uh, the Harlem Renaissance started around uh, 1919 and it ended around 1933. Mm -hmm. Now we take a kind of larger uh, historical view, okay. beginning with 1914 and going to at least 1937, Right. when Zora Neale Hurston published this book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, mm. which had been allowed to go out of print, mm. but now has sold millions of copies. Mm. Young uh, st women students and male students today mm. read this with great love and affection and come back to it uh, every year. My daughter mm. read this book every year mm. for many years. Mm. Uh, it's a kind of a, a feminist uh, manifesto of sorts uh, for younger readers. So that also kind of suggests uh, the connections between what was going on in 1990s mm. and uh, later. Right. Because my sense is that what uh, uh, Nathan Huggins and others uh, in the 1970s, when I was working on it, knew about Harlem Renaissance, mm. was a really a small segment of it. Mm -hmm. Now, Today, mm. Harlem Renaissance is a much bigger phenomenon mm. because a lot of more research has been done on sculptors, as you indicated, mm. musicians, mm. painters, uh, uh, non-fiction prose mm. writers, figures like Marcus Garvey, mm. uh, Du Bois, uh, Alan Locke, James Weldon Johnson, mm. Charles Chestnut in his later years. There's a lot going on mm. that uh, uh, Nathan Huggins and I were not directly concerned with. Right. When we wrote our first studies of right. the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. So, you know, as you're making, you know, the, this parallel yeah. between the Harlem Renaissance of then yeah. and now as well, uh, at that time, the backdrop, the civil rights movement, uh, so many stories of, you know, brutalities, things going on. What, where does it stand now? What has been taken forward? The momentum as well and the contemporary writers that you're having in today's? Well, the very important question that you raise. Uh, and, and I am so glad you mentioned the word civil rights with reference to Harlem Renaissance, mm. because most young people, most Americans, even white and black Americans, mm. when they think of civil rights, they think mostly of Martin Luther King. Yes. But the fact is that you cannot leave out major mm. figures mm like uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Booker T. Washington, mm. W.E.B. Du Bois, mm. and the NAACP, which was established in 1909 mm. and published a journal called The Crisis, mm. which went all over yeah. uh, black communities. Yeah. It was supported by uh, mm. liberal white people mm. and Jewish people. Mm. And uh, uh, people tried to pass anti-lynching laws. Mm. Uh, that did not happen. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, let me uh, you know, suggest quickly in the interest of time that you can find uh, such a variety of uh, attitudes mm. and uh, points of view mm. being expressed. Mm. Uh, you think of someone like Zora Neale Hurston or Nella Larson. Mm. But I want to give you the two broad examples that you started with, mm. Langston Hughes and Claude McKay. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, Claude McKay, who expressed uh, very volatile subjects yeah. in the uh, form of sonnets, mm. which was quite unusual. Mm. He has a sonnet uh, uh, called, If We Must Die. Mm. So do you mind if I read it please, and then we please. can talk about it? If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious pot. Mm. While round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mark at our accursed lot. Mm. If we must die, oh, well, let's nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Mm. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered, let's show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men we will face 
the murderous cowardly pack pressed to the wall dying but fighting back mm. now this is a poem that uh, so powerful uh, yes he was a west indian mm. background poet he came mm. from jamaica mm. and he wrote dialect poetry to begin with mm. and he was older than most of the uh, harlem renaissance writers that we have mentioned so far right with the possible exception of zora neale hurston and uh, he is writing in response to what happened to soldiers who came back from world war 1 mm. uh, they first were not included mm. uh, in the uh, the war effort mm. and then they were added and they mostly did uh, kind of uh, low level roles yeah the highest african american uh, to play a role in world war 1 mm. uh, was a man with a very odd name left then james europe mm. and he was a musician Mm -hmm. so he was supposed to entertain uh, the the forces so when they came back like mm. white americans uh, uh, in a segregated society mm. they also took out uh, victory parades mm -hmm. and in 26 cities mm. they were attacked mm. basically the message was just because you have participated in world war 1 mm. that does not give you the right to full civil rights mm. you're not so equal. civil rights is a yeah. much longer history Yeah. than just MLK mm. in the late 50s and the early 60s mm. and uh, you know you when you when you read this poem you think you are in the late 1960s that's true early 70s that's this true. Uh, um, militant self assertion mm. but the militant self assertion had been going on during the Harlem Renaissance by some writers and uh, even before that mm. and we were talking about the other poem mm. uh, the uh, langston hughes mm. the negro speaks of river yes, which exactly. he wrote at the age of 19 yeah and would you which also has would I, you I would love to it? yes i would because love to because i think to. it's a completely different completely different, different treatment expression exactly than, exactly uh, yeah this is more subdued more yes. philosophical whereas that is full of anger and yes. full of and very you know, richly nuanced very true yeah. very true okay so by langston hughes the negro speaks of rivers i've known rivers i've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins my soul has grown deep like the rivers i bathed in the euphrates when dawns were young i built my hut near the congo and it lulled me to sleep I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers and thank you for reading it in your deep voice <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's a, yeah, now, it's a look at how uh, uh, the economy of uh, images mm. and the economy of words mm. that uh, characterizes this poem mm. uh, because if you look at those lines in the long middle stanza yeah he is going from euphrates to the congo river it's time yeah to the mississippi exactly yeah. as and well so what's the point of euphrates yeah that's the beginning of civilization civilization ancient so civilization so he is basically fighting back these widespread yeah uh, from ancient times the oppression from that time he's right. speaking, and he's taking us back to civilization the beginning right. of civilization but also the uh, the fact that they were excluding Mm. from these narratives of civilization right. and narratives of history mm. so he's reminding us that african americans who, who were called negroes then mm. they were there at the beginning mm. they built the pyramids mm. they were by the congo river yeah and then in a very uh, deft move mm. he takes you to the emancipator yeah lincoln exactly you know at the mississippi river just like the river meanders Yeah. He's meandering as well That's with right. the, the the passing But very richly uh nuancing and uh, covering mm. the history mm. of the black race mm. including the Africans. So the th this is a very inclusive poem. Yeah. It doesn't leave out uh, Africa. It has a very copious definition of Africa mm. that includes places like Iraq mm. and places like Egypt. Mm. And of course the sub-sahara mm. africa mm. and then this uh, use of the river mm. 
flowing. Because a river will flow one way as well. Right. And then also the river is also the embodiment of life itself. Absolutely. They, they, they move yeah. and, 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 and life goes on. Yes, they have had challenges, mm. but they, like the river, mm. they are going to keep moving. Mm. Uh, they, nothing is going to stop them. Yeah. Because the the experience mm. uh, the, of hardships mm. and the joys and the possibilities and hopes of life mm. makes them such richly, uh, you know, mm. uh, 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 nuanced uh, uh, characters in human history. Yeah, he's claiming his place in human history mm. because of the stereotyping because of the negativity, mm. they were being constantly left out mm. of the history of civilization mm. and the history of a human mm. beings. He's, he, as you said, he's, he's telling people that we have been here, yes. we're here to stay, yes. and um, we are a part of this history, whether we are being acknowledged or not. Absolutely. I think that is the main thing about the, you know, the, the poetry, Literature, when it comes to literature and oppression, yes, any society, any uh, sort of you know sect or any community no, that has no. been facing oppression throughout the ages, whether cultural divides, religious divides, or whatever, and literature, class divides, yeah, exactly India, class yeah. divides as well. Literature has formed a major backbone to yeah. their expression. Absolutely, I mean, Tell I I that. think that literature is. Uh, a very integrative force. Mm. It's a very synthesizing force. It's mm. a very clari clarifying force. It's a very empowering force. Because uh, if two two things, for example, you know, if 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 if, if I am a, a member of a uh, marginalized group, an oppressed group, mm. uh, nobody can stop the possibility of my expressing mm. my pain, my grief, mm. my desires and my wishes. I mean, he has another poem, I'm the darker brother. Mm. I too sing America. Exactly. Walt Whitman was not the only one. Mm. And he says, uh, people will be ashamed mm. when they see how beautiful I am and how mm. strong I am. Mm. They will not ask me to go uh, eat in the kitchen. Mm. It's a very short poem. Mm. Uh, I too sing America. Mm. So I, I am always amazed at uh, Langston Hughes' ability to convey such a strong uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, you know continuity mm. and flow uh, uh, and uh, confidence yeah. uh, in such simple Sim language exactly uh, and, and and it would be a mistake to think that these are simple poems these are very they uh, layer upon they, layer, layer multi-tiered and with exactly. such simple diction yeah that you are you can't believe that he was able i mean that's his first poem as a pu first published uh, poem exactly at the age of 19 and, and this, this is remains when he was his most anthologized poem by Langston Hughes to this day. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And this is when he was taking a train journey. Yeah. And and he he saw uh, the he, river at that time. Mis, yeah. And that is when everything just started. And he had an envelope from a letter that his father had written to him. And yeah. he started writing on the back of that envelope. Yes. And his relationship with uh, uh, his father was uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, fraught. Mm because his father had left the uh, uh, United States to, and uh, became a ranch owner in Mexico. Mm. And when um, uh, Langston Hughes visited him, even as a young person, mm. even as a late teenager or you know, early 20s, mm. uh, he realized that his father's uh, m mindset had been really vitiated mm. by what he had suffered because he was treating Mexicans mm. in uh, such uh, awful ways. Mm. He literally became sick on his mm. second visit and then he never went back to visit. Mm. And uh, if I may mention a related story which is always a delightful story to tell. Mm. He was a student at Columbia, his father wanted him to be an engineer. Right. And uh, for one year he kept on um, pretending that he was an engineering student. Okay. And then he decided that he's not going to uh, keep this uh, uh, lie between him and his father. So okay. he wrote him and he took all his books and uh, to the East River and threw them in. Uh -huh. And he were held on to one book. Uh -huh. And guess what that was? That was Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Right. A poet he admired mm. and poet he modeled many of his own poems after. 
And uh, so I think, uh, and so going back to Claude McKay, yeah. now here's the two uh, poems which represent such a different mm. view of uh, looking at issues. A different yeah. expression, expression altogether. Yeah. That's right, yeah. that's right, but both very important. Very important. Very exactly. important voice. Because this is much more forceful, much more volatile, much yes. more, you know, dealing with the realities and brutalities of what, what's going on at that yeah. time. Yeah. McKay's, you mean? Yeah, McKay's, yeah. yeah. And then uh, Hughes uh, somehow they uses a little bit of indirectness. He uses mm. humor very frequently. Mm. He uses blues rhythms. Mm. He was one of the first poets to start using uh, mm. blues. Yeah. The and blues and jazz, that was also part oh, of the Oh, absolutely. He he started, well. he was one of the first African-American poets to mm. start sin singing with the blues musicians and mm. jazz bands. Because mm. yeah. that was something that was very significant as well at that time. And at that time, we also had that acting as a sort of a, you know, a, a, a gel, a sort of a bonding agent between the whites and uh, the people of color at that time, was it not? Well, are you referring to things like blackface? Yes. Oh, that was, uh, I mean, uh, sure. Uh, but I think, uh, 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 you know, in uh, retrospect, it seems like a pretty uh, uh, disturbing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, white people mm. doing blackface, performing blackness. Mm. Mm. And then blacks also started performing blackness mm. because there was money in it. Right. Well, there was an audience for that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And sure, in terms of uh, uh, their contribution to mm. uh, stage and dramatic art, mm. we cannot ignore it. But mm. in terms of what it did mm. to or what it meant to, uh, uh, to the African-American experience, mm. It's not a very good chapter in history. Uh -huh. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're talking about the different styles of the writers from the Renaissance. It was just such, so much more than just a literary movement. It was mm. something that was embedded into their soul. It was something that when people, they came across it, it was just so powerful and so powerfully moving. Uh, when, you know, where, where, where do we go from there when we look at America today? And we look at, we've had the time where they have had a president of color. Yes. So when those writers, if they could have envisioned the future of that time, what, what would have their sentiments been? That's, that's, that's a really uh, difficult question to answer, but an important one. I mean, you kind of raised that question earlier too. One could argue that in terms of uh, the advancement of civil rights, mm. Harlem Renaissance did not do a whole lot. Mm. But Why was that? When you had such powerful writers, you had such... I mean, these are some of those uh, mysteries of, uh, you know, life and society and politics. Mm. That things that uh, seem so logical to happen, they don't happen. Hmm. Uh, so I'm being a little philosophical, but... Because it's not the right time. Because people are not exactly. going to accept That's, that concept. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, if Du Bois and NAACP are asking for the basic rights, you know, hmm. uh, equal opportunity, uh, the right to vote, and the right to education and training. So something like this is just completely out of their league. That, That's right. Know? So one would think today that these are some very reasonable things. Yes. But at that time, these were seen as a huge affront. Mm. That's why just before Du Bois, you had someone like Booker T. Washington mm. saying, don't worry about it. Mm. Work hard, make as much money. Mm. Uh, there's a beautiful poem by Dudley Randall, uh, Booker T. and W.E.B., which is actually in this anthology, but I won't read it. Mm -hmm. But basically sets up them in a conversation. Mm. And Booker T. is saying, well, why do you bother, you know? Mm. Uh, just work the farm and work in a factory and mm -hmm. try to get along with white people. And Du Bois says, no, uh, if I want to learn philosophy or chemistry, I don't care what Miss, Mr. Charlie or you know, uh, uh, his wife want uh, mm. done by me. Mm. So these are two philosophies, the philosophy of uh, self-help and gradual mm. progress. Because uh, the attitude Booker T. Washington had, like those of whites, that African Americans are not yet ready for full citizenship. Mm. And the voice attitude is, give us full citizenship. Mm. 
and we will show you that we are more than capable of mm -hmm. handling its responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So these are two tensions that have continued mm -hmm. in African American history for a very long time. Okay. When we talk about migrants, yeah. people who People like move. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there are African American many migrants too, people going from the <laughs> south to the north. We'll, yeah. We can talk about that. Uh, so you know, you, you have a huge spectrum there when you yeah. when you're talking about migrants. To be able to, you know, you're not leaving a culture, you're carrying it along with you. Absolutely. But at the same time, being victimized, humiliated, oppressed uh, for who you are and what you stand for, what does that do to a human being in general? That's a, <laughs> a very deep question. First of all, I think we're just one simple way today is that look at how the patterns of migration have changed. First of all, as many people are, are, who study migration mm. from the beginnings of uh, human history, mm. the Homo sapiens mm. history, we have always been migrating. Yeah. We have never been satisfied with being where we are. But for different reasons throughout. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But uh, so uh, many people would make the argument that that's the basic human right. Mm and it should be mm. respected. Mm. And of course, then we are aware of the borders and the refugees mm. and all the conversation we have had about the Syrian refugees and so on. Yeah. But uh, in, in the strict American context, I would say that the uh, situation has changed from around 1900, mm -hmm. when a lot of the Europeans came, mm. to the post-1965 migration, mm. when uh, the uh, uh, immigrants have not had that much of difficulty. It's right. sure, right. if you are going to move to a new society mm. which functions in different ways, which mm. has uh, uh, different ways of doing things, uh, you are going to have difficulties. Right. But people are not any longer being made ashamed. Exactly. Uh, but we, we are going to come back to this. We have yeah. to go for a break right now. Yeah. Uh, so don't change the channel. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back to the program. We're having a fantastic time with our fabulous guest, Amritza. Thank you so much for being with us Thank here you. today. And you know, also we, we're joining in this celebration that this is your first time back in Pakistan as well. Yeah. Uh, so for us as well, it's a, it's a lovely you. moment. Thank and, you, I appreciate um, that. Yeah, and we've been having a, a wonderful conversation. Okay, now let's talk about poetry. Mm -hmm. You haven't published that much poetry, but... I've not written about poetry. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. great. Uh, but, you know, we were speaking about the importance of poetry. Yes. Now, I have sort of two concerns here. Mm -hmm. From, you know, school days, we remember those poems that we learnt. Yes. You know, in our formative years. Yes. And they stayed with us. Yes. Somewhere, mm -hmm. they found their way into our soul, into our heart. Mm -hmm. And even now, we can associate ourselves with them we can sort of it, it did something to us that you know something that's really not you can can't always explain it mm -hmm. so there's there's the poetic um, aspect nowadays we, we'll come to this question to ad uh, address this as well children with surrounded with technical gadgets yes whereas you know you'd love to see them being surrounded by books yes so how so my question for you later it. on as well is you know <laughs> how do we get the children back to poetry and you know tell us about the importance of poets and poetry in your mind well i mean the, the it's it's a it's really a painful thing for mm. uh, teachers at college level these days mm. even in the united states mm where at one point uh, reading used to be a very important habit with young people. True. I remember when I first came to NYU, students would be waiting to meet their professors during the office hours, and mm. they'll be buried in a book. Mm. The gadgets have completely destroyed. I think there is a sense that Googling is everything. Mm. And, and Googling is not uh, to be completely uh, you know, condemned. Mm. But I think what it gives is a very superficial. That's exactly sense, the word I yeah, was thinking of yeah, right now. Superficial. Of 
people are not reading books, uh, you know, cover to cover. No. They won't even read an essay from yeah. the first page to the last page. And in fact, isn't it that, you know, with your instant food and your instant coffee and your instant everything else, it's now sort of instant knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Something, um, if, if there is a book, yeah. somebody would rather just read the summary or, or the notes Just to the it. blurbs in the back. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Google the, mm. what uh, the review. Wiki, Wikipedia says. <laughs> or the notes to uh, yeah, it. Yeah, notes, you know. Yeah. So I think it's a, a, a pretty disturbing trend. Mm. So two things I want to say. One is that uh, uh, I feel as a teacher uh, in, in the classroom where I teach short stories, I read essays mm. uh, with the, my students, novels, plays. Mm. And uh, knowing uh, the challenges we are facing, I include a lot of poems. I'll tell you why I do that. Mm. Because I think if you want to learn how to read a work of literature, mm. there is no better way to do that than engage with a poem. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that even if they have not read the poem before they come to class, which is often the case, mm. I can get them to read the poem aloud and mm. we can discuss it for half an hour, 40 minutes, or even the whole class, mm. depending on the poem we are doing. So. I am giving them uh, uh, certain tools, certain processes that then they can take to a, a work of fiction by Toni Morrison or by William Faulkner or by Hemingway or mm. Fitzgerald. Mm. So that's one thing. The second, your question, what can we do <laughs> about kids too? Yeah. I have a, a nephew who has two sons who are between two and seven and they are fighting with their parents all the time trying to get the gadgets. Yeah. And they're constantly making deals. If you do this, <laughs> I'll let you right. have uh, this for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And this battle that goes on. I think, fortunately, mm -hmm. people are still fond of songs. Yeah. They're still fond of music. Mm -hmm. If we can put poems, mm -hmm. especially short poems, mm -hmm. Robert Frost, uh, Emily Dickinson, mm -hmm. uh, you know, now, Rupi Kaur is mm -hmm. getting a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. She is a South Asian Canadian. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is doing Insta Instagram. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of uh, overcoming these mm -hmm. barriers. So what you're saying is just make, the, make it more appealing. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, make them part of, because as you said about your childhood, and yeah. I, I remember that childhood, yeah. a professor of mine, Professor Kalia, he mm -hmm. used to say, you need to possess a few poems. Yeah. And so in my life, I'm constantly referring back anything that I think about, anything that happens to me, anything that mm. I confront, two poems, mm. uh, my favorite poems. Yeah. For example, I, I uh, read uh, Emily Dickinson. Every time I read, I'm carrying these two very simple anthologies. Right. One is done in England and one is a dower. This is uh, like one dollar. Mm -hmm published in uh, Long Island, okay. uh, New York. Right. And every time I read, I come upon a poem that I've never come across before. Mm. And it has the possibility of becoming my favorite poem. I'll mm. read you one. Please, uh, please, let's. Uh, the, the British anthology gave it a title. Mm. Of course, Emily Dickinson gave, in, gave titles to her poem. We mm. know her poem mostly by the first line. Mm. We never know how high we are till we are called to rise. Mm. And then, if we are true to plan, our st st statures touch the skies. The heroism we recite would be a daily thing. Mm. Did not ourselves the cubits warp for fear to be a king? Mm. Now, the last two lines are a little, uh, uh, you know, ambiguous. Yeah. But it's Lost clearly, the, you know, she's hinting at mm. uh, the idea of uh, finding your voice, yeah. which to me is very important when mm. I teach literature. Mm. And then the other one, which is very well known, mm. and which kind of raises the same question to a very different level. Mm. Much madness is divinest sense mm. to a discerning eye. Mm. Much sense, the starkest madness. It's the majority in this, as all prevail. We have been talking about issues of inclusiveness. Mm. Ascent, A-S-S-E-N-T, mm. ascent and you are sane. Demur, you are straightway dangerous mm. and handled with a chain. 
Right. And clearly the poem is hinting yes. that unless you are able to Fitted. live by your own conviction, exactly. you may, you know, mm. it may be a Jesus Christ mm. or it may be a Nelson Mandela, mm. uh, it may be Martin Luther King, mm. but then, you know, you, you are less of a human for not living up to your full potential exactly. and your full capacity to live by your conviction. Mm. So for me, those kind of uh, those little bits of, uh, you know, wisdom that right. come with it. And I'm always looking for that and it's so much easier to find them in poetry once you overcome the fear of reading poetry, now, which my students have. Now, that is a very important point. Yeah. Because when you talk, there are so many people yeah. that you talk to, not just children, yeah. adults as well, yes. and they'll say, oh, you know, my God. poetry? No, please. Yeah. And, and the, just exactly the same expression, a fear. Yeah. The fear of what? W what is it? Because, uh, because poetry is so succinct and so intense and so condensed in its expression, mm. it just seems to make demands on your imagination that, let's say, a short story mm. or a novel in the form of narrative, mm. which we are used to. We are always telling stories. Yeah. True. It's much more familiar. Mm. But uh, a poem like Emily Dickinson's poem or a Robert Frost poem, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 even The Road Not Taken, oh, you fantastic. know, which is, a, I Classic. think, a very cynical poem. Yeah. People think uh, it's... Think it's something, but it's something else. It's something yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, a mending wall, mm -hmm. which people think it's about good fences make good neighbors, mm -hmm. but it's actually the opposite of that. Yeah. It's, it's, the poem starts by saying, yeah. something there is, that there is that doesn't love a wall. Mm. So basically his project is to destroy this uh, dominance of this mm. saying, mm. good fences good, make good neighbors. Yeah. And, and when you start discovering yeah. those uh, variables, mm. the way the poet achieves uh, this makes mm. you think. And again, a line from that poem comes, spring is the mischief in me. Mm. And I would like to put a notion in his head, his neighbor. Uh -huh. I think my whole teaching is about putting a notion in the head of my students. Again, yeah. that is just such a profound yeah. statement, isn't it? Uh, because that's where it all starts. Yeah, you cannot the push mind. it. The mind. Yeah. The unshackling. That's right. The unshackling of the mind Absolutely. from preconceived notions yeah. and concepts that yeah. you have either about acquired. About poetry and about life. And grown up with. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so I hope, so I mean, I can't say <laughs> <laughs> that what I'm doing works, but I think I, I see it working too. It's amazing. Yeah. It's actually, uh, you know, it's a liberating yeah. uh, process, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Because um, you come across so many people in life, so many people who are not realizing their full potential. Yeah. Because sometimes we are our worst critics yeah. and our worst enemies. Yeah. And then another way I learned is, uh, you know, the, this, uh, the idea of translation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Please tell us about this. Yeah. Because uh, uh, here are poems. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is a volume uh, of uh, 50 poems by the same poet, mm -hmm. Gurchan Rampuri, who is mm -hmm. 88, mm -hmm. lives in uh, Vancouver. He's uh, originally uh, from uh, uh, the uh, area of Jalandhar. He mm -hmm. started writing poetry when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So he's been writing... Uh, uh, poems for about 70 years. Mm -hmm. His mind is still strong, his body is flay. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I did it, these poems with a couple of friends, uh, mostly with the Judy Ray, who is actually a, uh, an English woman who lives in the... because I wanted to make them into poems in English. Right. And that took a lot of effort. This was mm -hmm. all a labor of love. Mm -hmm. I was not doing it for merit pay mm -hmm. <laughs> or promotion. Right. And uh, these uh, 50 poems were done over Ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Ten and then years. I had a hard time finding That really is a, a labor publisher. of love. And I must tell you something, uh, Shabnam. Mm. Uh, I was going to read a poem by Mr. Rampuri, mm. and uh, you very kindly gave me your own uh, collection, mm -hmm. The Whispering Wind. Yeah. And I'm glancing at the opening poem, and it leads directly into the poem by Rampuri that I was going to read. Oh, that's fantastic coincidence. <laughs> so forgive my uh, rough throat, but mm. I'm going to read this poem. Pleasure. Whispering wind. A wondrous mystic whispering wind when secrets lie within the air 
of sounds once known to lover songs who promised everlasting care. What hidden myths were swept ahead to make their way through eras gone, the wars they lost, the hearts they won, the cries of time still float along. But you have known each hill and plain and been to every darkest cave, then graced the oceans with your touch to shape the mood of every wave. So take these words along with you to sweep the earth's each fold and crease, caress all ears with prayers of love, become the breeze that preaches peace. Thank you and thank you for sharing this volume with me. Thank you for yeah. reading it. It's yeah, nice. and Rampuri, we did uh, all kinds of poems. There are romantic poems, there are mm. political poems, there are uh, philosophical poems. And uh, it's uh, an amazing coincidence that the mm -hmm. first poem that I was uh, chosen to read by him, right. it, it kind of just, uh, this is, your poem provides a nice seg into it. Okay, right. And it's called, Let This Home Begin to Think Again. Mm. Isn't this home a bit too noisy? Here reason sleeps and chronic angers reign. Everyone shouts but no one listens. Let's get this home thinking again. Let it learn to be silent, to meditate, and to reject the posturing of power as it begins to embrace truth. Let this home open the third eye and look inward as do the wise. Let its members dive deep to find pearls that lie at the bottom of the ocean of words. When this home is able to hear the whisper of a breeze caressing young green leaves, then will flowers bloom again in our lives and the long night of the innocent suffering will end. Mm -hmm. And you see, the, the, I see the, the kind of the uh, undertones mm. uh, going there. Mm. I think I would, uh, in view of our conversation mm. about home, uh, Pindi, Ambala, mm. moving to New York, mm. and the divisions and the suspicions that we talked about, the barriers, the boundaries, right. the borders. Mm. I think I would like to, if you uh, please close with uh, this uh, poem from Rampuri, mm. which is the final poem. Mm. And this poem is uh, printed in uh, Gurumukhi and Shamukhi. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then the English translation, very short poem uh -huh. and very relevant to some of the topics we have okay. uh, talked about today. In Punjabi first, mm. Lakir, Asal vich na main te tu i koi saan, Samay di kundi churi ne, Hikri saadi te pa diti lakir, Par fakira da lakira nal ki hai vasta, E vazira de hi kam, and then we wanted it to become a poem in English. Of course. Not a literal translation. How much of that was a challenge for you to It was a huge to challenge. These, these poems went through 10 drafts sometimes. They took months, each poem. Mm. We were doing it with email. We would have joint sessions together. Mm. I would travel to Tucson, Arizona, where Judy lives with our mm. poet uh, husband, uh, mm. David Ray. Or, uh, they would travel to Rhode Island, where mm. I lived when we were doing this poem. So this is how it goes in English. Right. Dividing line. Once you and I were one, time's blunt knife has etched a line in our chest. But what do ordinary people care about borders? It's only politicians who find a use for boundaries. Our clothes and patch blankets are torn into shreds. Let's sit somewhere in the shade and mend them. Let's break bed together. Fantastic. Thank you. That is amazing. Yeah. That is that is a wonderful close yeah. to today's you know program and what we've been talking about. Yeah. And you know exactly the the process of mending, the process of healing. Yes. I think that is also so important when we talk talk about poetry it is food for the soul is it not absolutely and what uh, I've been trying to say maybe I did not always say it uh, as clearly the um, the the humans have empathy mm. humans have imagination mm. and when they can exercise that empathy and imagination mm. to get inside the skin of someone else mm. the other mm the marginalized, the different, 
So whether you are migrant or not, whether you are living in homeland and dealing with challenges like that, or whether you migrate to another country, mm. it, it, it applies. And uh, the point when you raised uh, about uh, migration mm. just before the break, I would say that in the United States, we often get a very cheery narrative mm. of uh, America as a nation of uh, migrants, nation of, yeah. but we do it at the cost of forgetting mm. the citizenship rights that were, uh, did not uh, get uh, to other groups. Mm the non-immigrant groups, mm. like African-Americans, mm. who went there against their, they were taken there against yes, their wishes. Exactly. Native Americans, mm. who were put through a lot of brutality. Mm. And Chicanos. Mm. So I think citizenship rights are centered in migration, mm. but we have to look at the internal migration mm. as well as the immigration. Mm. So it's a complex uh, issue, and those comparisons are very important. Right. Also, you know, um, we, we didn't get some time, so, so just briefly as well. Also, you've been, you know, working, uh, you've been senior editor of MELA and mm -hmm. then South Asian uh, Literary, Literary Association. Association as well. So tell us a bit about that as well. Because well, we MELA, MELA was a series from Rutgers. Um, we wanted to exactly uh, bring uh, literary texts uh, that had kind of uh, gone out of print. We wanted to bring them back. Uh, Jewish American autobiographies, Chinese American novels, uh, Japanese American uh, uh, narratives, Italian American, and we published 12 books. Mm. But, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the publisher had higher expectations of the sales, uh -huh. okay. you know, and that's become a very mm. big issue, but we were very fortunate to have a very uh, wonderful editor, Leslie Michener. Mm -hmm. So those 12 volumes are out and uh, I'm uh, hoping that they will continue. Uh, SALA, South Asian Literary Association, publishes a journal called South Asian Review. Mm -hmm. And uh, many uh, Pakistanis and Indians contribute to it. In fact, uh, there's a possibility that we'll start doing some SALA events in places like Lahore and New Delhi. Great. Uh, there are some conversations. Uh, definitely, uh, 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 Pakistani scholars have been on the executive. They have played an important role. There was a special issue of Anglophone uh, Pakistani writing done mm. by Fozi Afsal Khan and mm -hmm. Dr. Vaseem Anwar a few years ago. We mm -hmm. have done similar issues on Sri Lanka mm -hmm. uh, and Bangladesh. Mm. So it, we tried to be more inclusive and the journal is now going to be published by Taylor and Francis. And I've been part of, a, there's an organization called Melas. Mm. which is not to be confused with MELA, Multi-Ethnic Literature of United States. Okay. Uh, I was the president in the 90s, and uh, there are chapters in Europe and chapters right. in India. Right. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Amrajit Singh, thank you so much for being with us here today. It's truly been a fantastic program where we've been able to talk about so many things that, you know, you usually don't get uh, a chance to speak about and to recognize and to understand. And, you know, your lifelong association with literature, it's also heartening to see that passion as well. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and and also look. wish you more, you know, more uh, uh, joyous trips to Pakistan as well in the future. I'm looking forward to my visit to Lahore I'm and the sure. conference and yeah, thank right. you very much. Okay, so we come to the end of today's program. We had a fabulous guest in the studio and you know, there were just so many points that you can pick up on, so many things uh, to think about and lots of food for thought. And the main thing is that, you know, uh, get past your fear of poetry as well. Pick up a poem and uh, just have a try, have a read and see how it fits with you. Until next week then, stay happy. Bye-bye.